very warm welcome to all our distinguished speakers uh, on behalf of the Civil Society Coalition for Climate Change and the World Bank to the Impactful Speakers uh, series. When we talk about global warming, I think two things come to my mind. One is the increase in the temperature, and the other one is the erratic uh, changes in patterns in precipitation and hydrology. Accelerated melting, as we know, has multiple uh, consequences, but today we're going to focus on the impact on sea level rise. And when we talk about sea level rise, I think, and vulnerability, what first comes to my mind is the small island developing states, since they are perhaps one of the most vulnerable. But that doesn't mean that countries that have a coastline don't face a threat either. So we're going to focus on the perils of sea level rise to countries that have a coastline. Pakistan does have a fairly large coastline. It extends over 1,050 kilometers, of which 800 kilometers fall in Balochistan and 250 in Sindh province. 40% uh, of the development of the industrial type is also located near the coastal areas. And 20% of other developed uh, communities live near the coastal belt. 10% are in the close vicinity. So that poses multiple challenges to Pakistan. We have with us, uh, and we are very honored to have uh, such a distinguished panel that is going to look into the different aspects of these threats that we face and how well prepared are we, Pakistan, as a nation, as a people, to strengthen our coastal resilience. To moderate the session, we are very honored to have with us Mr. Mozam uh, Khan. Mozam is one of the leading fishery scientists in the country. After graduating from DJ Sindh uh, Government uh, Science College, he obtained a master's degree in marine bi biology from the University of Karachi, securing a first class position. He also obtained his MS degree in zoology from the University of Hawaii in Honolulu. Mr. Mozam has been associated with fisheries research and administration since 1973, so he's a very expert veteran in this subject. He's a member of, the, of a number of national and international organizations, as well as a member of the scientific committee of WWF. Mr. Moazam has published more than 230 scientific papers in national and international journals. So uh, Moazam, I pass the floor to you to take this conversation forward and moderate this session. Thank you. And I see Mr. Riaz Bagan has also joined us. So welcome, uh, Mr. Bagan. Thank you very much, Ashafar. Mr. Mozum, the floor is yours to moderate the panel discussion. Mr. Mozum, can you hear? He's probably mute. The perils of virtual connectivity and the glitches in technology. There is some issue with the... There you are. Uh, can you hear me now? Is the Excuse issue at your end, Mr. Mawson? Or uh, can our admin help you? Yeah, can you hear me? Because uh, uh, I can see the voice going, but uh, I don't know whether you can hear me or not. We can hear you. We can hear you, Muslim sir. So, okay, uh, let me start. I'm, we can hear you. I, yeah, I, thank you very much, uh, uh, Aisha, for uh, giving me an opportunity to the, moderate this particular session. And we have an elite panel of experts that we have with us so to discuss the enhancing coastal resilience for Sindh and Balochistan. Uh, as Aisha was pointing, uh, pointing out that the communities that are living in uh, islands and on the coast area, they are exposed to uh, a number of uh, uh, disaster, a number of uh, uh, natural uh, calamities that affect them. And especially in case of Balochistan, the historical record goes back to about uh, many thousand years. There are evidence of uh, 
the coastal community being suffering in the Holocene period about more than 50,000 years back. And then uh, in the recent past, about 300 years back, we had coastal community of Baluchistan suffering because of a collapse of a major area because of uh, uh, an earthquake. And they I still remember some of the areas that this is, they call it 1,000 uh, camels uh, event in which one particular platform on the coastline was collapsed. And then uh, 1945 uh, uh, earthquake and the damage that has been done because of the tsunami. But the good thing about this particular event was the, was the traditional knowledge. The casualty would have been much, much higher if the coastal community were not aware of the uh, how to deal with uh, uh, such a situation. So the resilience was there. Most of the population living in the coastline at that time moved to higher ground. That's why there was very little casualty as compared to the size of this particular region. Then there are cyclones, the events are increasing. There are frequent cyclones, there are uh, storm surges, there are floodings, uh, the coastal communities in Pakistan and in the other areas of the globally, they are increasing. So today we will be discussing about how we can make these community uh, resilient to face these coastal, uh, these disasters, and also uh, to see where we stand at present. So we have uh, five speakers, and uh, considering the Ramadan and considering that the limitation, each speaker will be given about seven minutes of time, so they can uh, share their view, and then we will have a question answer session. May I request the participant to post their question on the chat box so that we can address them, uh, considering their importance and considering them in, in sequentially. So. Uh, let me start the uh, formal proceeding of this particular webinar. And uh, our first uh, speaker is Ms. Uh, Savarna Kazi. Uh, she is a senior disaster risk management specialist in the World Bank uh, and uh, the Bangladesh focal point for the global facility for disaster reduction and recovery. And she has been associated with uh, the World Bank for a very long period, now more than about 15 years. And prior to them, she was working for uh, DEFRA as evidence and policy advisor. So she has uh, master degrees in uh, from Oxford University. So may I request uh, Savarna Kazi to uh, start uh, your presentation so that uh, we can be benefited from your experience and experience from uh, how the things can be. So, Savarna, please. Uh, very good morning. Thank you so much, sir. Um, and a very good morning to all. Uh, my name is Shorna Kazi. I'm a senior disaster management specialist of the World Bank. And I'll be showcasing Bangladesh's journey towards coastal resilience and how some of these approaches may be applicable for Pakistan. So, when flying along the coast of Bangladesh, you'll see a vast delta landscape, which is crisscrossed by rivers and paddy fields. However, this may mask the magnitude of disaster risks faced by the country in terms of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. Bangladesh is exposed to cyclones, storm surges, floods, landslides, and even earthquakes. And it sits on the front lines in the battle against climate change. We're a nation of 165 million. It's also among the world's most densely populated. In the coastal zone, the cyclones are the most well-known hazard with on average one severe tropical cyclone every three years. Bangladesh is ranked number one in vulnerability to tropical cyclones in the world. Another hazard, erosion, is also seriously threatening coastlines. However, uh, despite these challenges, Bangladesh is a story of resilience. In 1970, Cyclone Bola, the world's deadliest tropical cyclone on record, made landfall and devastated the coastline. According to official estimates, the cyclone resulted in over 300,000 lives lost. Fast forward 50 years, cyclones of comparable intensity resulted in around 3,000 lives lost. Fatalities have declined a hundredfold. 
So this remarkable progress is the result of systematic investment in resilience over the last decades. So protecting lives, livelihoods, and assets from disasters has been key to Bangladesh's development strategy. This has been through policy and institutional strengthening, uh, large-scale infrastructure investments, hydromet initiatives, community-based early warning systems, as well as enhancing analytics for resilience. Investments such as the multi-purpose disaster shelter project, which is constructing and rehabilitating around a thousand shelters and over 400 kilometers of access and evacuation roads. These disaster shelters are multi-purpose in a simple yet innovative way. Throughout the year, they serve as schools and they become safe havens during disasters. This is all closely integrated with a long-standing uh, cyclone preparedness program, which is supporting community-based early warning systems. Investments also include the Coastal Embankment Improvement Project, which aims to protect vulnerable coastal areas, helping safeguard against tidal floods, cyclones, storm surges, salinity intrusion, coastal erosion. So works include up upgradation of embankments, construction and rehabilitation of hydraulic structures, construction of bank and slope protection, and associated drainage infrastructure. This project, it's also integrating nature-based solutions initiative through this afforestation component, which is embedding social forestry. This engages the local communities to ensure benefit sharing as part of an overall integrated protection program. Planting mangroves and other saline tolerant species, the project is establishing an added layer of protection, reducing the impact of tidal flooding and storm surge. The species, they're carefully selected considering the location, the level of protection provided and co-benefits to the local population. Finally, the project is expected to also increase agricultural productivity, food security and creation of jobs, all part of a resilient strategy. In-depth uh, analytics are also undertaken to better understand uh, large scale dynamics of the Delta to inform the coastal resilience approach. These activities include uh, data analysis, modeling, extensive stakeholder consultations, uh, knowledge exchanges to see firsthand and, and be inspired, and all with the overarching aim to help uh, better design future investments along the coast. So I'll focus on four specific analytics and focus on some of the key takeaways. The first uh, was developing concept design solutions for coastal erosion. Like in both Bangladesh and Pakistan, erosion of uh, riverbanks on the coast is an increasing uh, challenge. Finding cost-effective solutions for erosion, it's not straightforward, but provide an opportunity to leverage multifunctionality and also use uh, nature-based solutions. One such innovative and integrative solution is shown. This is a multifunctional embankment uh, in combination with a groin field and sediment nourishment. This is to propose to combat uh, coastal erosion while also enhancing flood protection and developing tourism and other economic activities. So similar concept design exercise may be done in Pakistan coastal zone to see what would be feasible. The next analytics touched upon mangrove opportunities. Mangrove systems can help uh, prevent erosion, reduce wave attack by dampening wave energy, but not all locations are suitable for mangroves. So a method has been developed to identify uh, potential sites near existing mangrove patches for the coastal zone. Here, some of the sites with the high restoration potential are depicted on this map. Similarly, uh, for the coastline of Pakistan, identifying mangrove opportunities could be combined with uh, coastal protection investments. The next activity explored the added value of a more risk-based and probabilistic approach in design of coastal systems. This was done by a detailed review of flood risk frameworks, which have been adopted in various countries around the world with large systems of embankments and dams, such as the United States, uh, Netherlands, Vietnam, Australia. 
So a comprehensive risk framework would add to enhance uh, systematic planning, design, and maintenance of the coastal measures to reduce risk. And finally, the analytics presented is the empirical evidence for future investments. So review of past projects revealed the construction of embankments and shelters in combination with early warning have been very successful interventions for reducing risk from cyclones in the coastal zone and thereby improving the livelihoods of millions of people. This can be derived from the strong reduction in casualties during cyclones. The review also highlighted uh, six areas which need more attention for future programs. So I'll just focus on number two as an example. Uh, project interventions usually take more time than originally anticipated. In Bangladesh, we see that acquiring the land for building in infrastructure is one of the important hurdles during these projects. So a more realistic planning for these activities uh, would be helpful in, in improving the process and also accelerate implementation of these types of projects. Overall, a few takeaways are as follows. Interventions many times focus on three of the five pillars of a strategic investment agenda. Uh, coastal protection through embankments and integrated polar systems, impact reduction through shelters and early warning, uh, residual risk reduction through community-based programs to support livelihoods. While these are critical and must not be neglected, looking forward, there are other opportunities. For example, ha hazard reduction by working more with nature and seeking more nature-based solutions, and also uh, better linking the spatial planning of economic uh, activities in coastal zones, including thinking about how and to what level these activities must be protected against coastal threats. Finally, the ultimate proof of all these investments and in analytics is in its practical application and support to the people to improve their life and, and boost their prosperity. This is universal for Bangladesh, Pakistan, and all. Uh, thank you very much. This is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Savarna, it's, uh, especially for uh, confining within the time limits, which are, we are very short of time. So the next speaker on the line is uh, Commander uh, Sayyid so Salman Shah. I hope he is there. And uh, uh, Sayyid Salman Shah has joined Pakistan Navy in 1991. And but since 2013, he is heading the uh, Provincial Disaster Management Authority. And uh, with this authority, he has been uh, instrumental in uh, dealing with various disasters that we have suffered in the past uh, 18 or 19 years, uh, including the uh, third desert, uh, third drop in 2013-14, floods of 2013-14, power and earthquake, cyclones, and heavy landfall during the last two years. So may I have uh, Commander Sayyid Salman Shah? Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to be part of this, this such a wonderful uh, gathering in which you people are discussing one of the most favorite subject of mine, that is the resilience and how to improve upon it. I'm sorry I joined you late because of some technical issue with my computer, but uh, uh, what I can, uh, uh, what I have read from the concept note and the which I have attended, that we are talking about uh, the coastal resilience, especially for Sindh and Balochistan, that how, what are uh, we doing currently and how we can improve upon it and make the uh, coastal community more resilient. Uh, uh, as you are aware that uh, World Bank is undertaking a project uh, in uh, uh, Sin, uh, uh, in which uh, which is called Sin Resilience Project. Under this project, we are uh, carrying out an uh, extensive activity all across the Sin, in which we uh, are carrying out multi-hazard vulnerability risk assessment. Because risk identification is the key to any future DRR investment or intervention. Uh, under this activity, uh, though we are 
uh, carrying out uh, this multi hazard vulnerability assessment all across the SIN, but the coastal areas are, uh, as you are aware, are more uh, vulnerable to various sort of uh, sort of hazards. So that is also being covered. Uh, the coastal areas of SIN, especially the Badin, uh, the Thatta, Sejawal districts, parts of, uh, and then uh, uh, after completion of this study, we will be exactly in a position to identify which DRR interventions uh, will be uh, cost benefit uh, as per the cost benefit analysis uh, will be uh, will be worth undertaking uh, to reduce the vulnerability of these areas and make them more resilient. Apart from that, uh, with the assistance of the National Disaster Risk Management Fund, uh, we are uh, working uh, on a project which is called the Tsunami Early Warning System. Same uh, similar project is being undertaken by uh, UNDP in uh, uh, Baluchistan as well as Sindh province uh, in few districts. Like uh, in Sindh, it is being done in one district and in Baluchistan, it is being done in another district. So we are just replicating the same sort of project with the help of uh, uh, Sindh government's funding and the NDMRF uh, counterpart funding. So uh, we will cover entire coast of Sindh in which we install around 14 uh, uh, early warning uh, towers or this, uh, the equipment which will help the most vulnerable community all across the uh, coastal belt uh, for uh, the for providing them early warning with regards to the tsunamis and cyclones. Uh, another project with, on which we are, I am currently working upon is the uh, uh, early warning to the coastal to the fishy, uh, fishermen because it happens what I have experienced in the last few years that. Uh, fishermen, they, once they are out at sea, then the uh, mechanism for in, informing them about uh, the, uh, the cyclones or the other sort of hazards which are likely to hit the coastal area is very less, uh, is not that much uh, uh, streamlined. So I am in coordination with the uh, fishermen community and their associations for making a comprehensive uh, plan of action uh, for providing them early warning. As you know that our coastal community they, uh, mostly they are fishermen and their uh, financial resilience depends upon uh, their, their, their livelihood is uh, uh, fishing. And if they are disturbed because of any reason, then overall resilience factor is, uh, uh, is reduced in that area. Uh, uh, apart from this, uh, National Institute of, I'm also working with the National Institute of Oceanography, uh, in which we are uh, uh, making or uh, improving some observatories and uh, measurement system in sea and coastal belt of Pakistan to identify changes in co coastal ecosystem and sea level or sea intrusion phenomena active in coastal belt of Sin. NED University is also working on different research and development initiatives uh, in collaboration with uh, NIO. And uh, these, in uh, these initiatives uh, on, or the researches or the studies will help uh, to improve the knowledge on coastal ecosystem and then how to revive it back. Um, you must be aware that uh, uh, Agriculture Department of SIN also uh, worked on restoration of uh, mangroves uh, in the coastal belt or the Indus Delta, and uh, which has brought some very fruitful results in the last few years. And that could be seen and appreciated by everyone that uh, how this uh, ecosystem is re uh, reversed, uh, reversed or revised back to its uh, near original, uh, what we had about around 40, 50 years back. Currently, the main issue which I see in the uh, in our coastal region uh, of Sen and Balutsan as well, that is the sea intrusion. Um, you must be all be aware that sea intrusion has really uh, taken away, not only taken away the uh, uh, precious land from us, but also they have taken away the livelihood sources also. Uh, in the coastal belt or in the coastal region. And these livelihood sources, um, uh, we have to revert, uh, we have to bring those back by uh, carrying out certain interventions through which the livelihood uh, is back to normal or, uh, or the innovative methods and, uh, are involved in which, which, uh, which can help them uh, to recover their livelihood. 
uh, I think I have spoken. If you have any questions, then I will be able to more uh, inform you or uh, discuss upon it in detail. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Commander Sayed uh, Salman. Uh, question and answer. We'll be having a session after the uh, fourth presentation, uh, uh, the remaining presentation, and then you can uh, you can add us to all of them. So next presenter is uh, Riaz Ahmed Wagan. Uh, Mr. Riaz Ahmed Wagan is the Chief Conservator of Forest uh, with the Forest Department, Government of uh, Sin and he is mangrove, involved mainly in mangroves and detained land uh, management. Uh, Mr. Hogan has done his master in forestry from Pakistan Forest, forest Institute, and he joined the department in 1992. He also done master uh, in uh, environment management uh, from, uh, and development from Australian National University, and he has been involved in the mangrove plantation and management of the coastal area since very long. A very good friend of uh, all of us. May I request Mr. Riyaz Ahmed Wagan to uh, make a presentation on the topic that we are discussing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mazam Saab. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So thanks for the introduction and uh, uh, I'm here to, uh, I don't have any presentation uh, to upload, but uh, I will briefly tell you about the efforts of uh, forestry department of Sindh in uh, ecosystem management, mangrove ecosystem management and rehabilitation. So uh, vis -a vis this uh, uh, resilience uh, issue, uh, as the earlier speakers say that, the proper thing is the identification of the hazard. And then once the, your early warning systems, the hazard uh, identification mechanism is in place, then you will be having proper uh, interventions in place. So this is the most important thing that has been, that is being done by uh, PDMA and other uh, NIU and other uh, uh, organizations in particularly, uh, I'm talking of Sin coastal area. So my, uh, the role of forestry department, uh, uh, since uh, everybody knows that in 1999, the uh, cyclone that hit the coastal areas of Madin and Jawal, that was very severe and a lot of uh, damage done in that particular cyclone. And uh, uh, everybody saw that uh, the livelihood of the local people that uh, uh, were in shambles and the infrastructure was in shambles and everything was, uh, nobody knew about that. Uh, uh, you can say the cyclone and, uh, the, and the after effects were uh, uh, so long that even, even till today, people have not uh, revived to their uh, originality. So now, uh, uh, the role of forest department in, in all this scenario is that forest department possesses certain area that is about 600,000 hectares uh, in the delta. And the, the, the delta is uh, historical delta uh, emerged from the Indus River system. And uh, it, it has a history of having about 10,000 uh, uh, hectares uh, area and uh, starting from say, uh, Hyderabad up to up to Omar Court in some times, but yeah, that was the history. But now it, it is we have about six hundred thousand hectares and more than that area, and it is uh, increasing every year with the sea intrusion in those fertile lands of the local people, which are at the verge of uh, you can say the tidal system. So that is the uh, major threat vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, the livelihoods and the resilience of the local people, how to protect these people from the uh, sea surges and the sea intrusion, uh, and particularly the people who are living at the fringes or they are part of, say, another ecosystem. Because I, I, I will always say that the people who are enjoying their uh, their agriculture fields, the, the crops of their agricultural fields, they are not dependent at the moment on the coastal ecosystem. But we 
due to this uh, uh, sea intrusion phenomena and lack of water in the upstream areas for the for those agricultural lands we are losing those particular areas year by year and that needs to be stopped and that the, the efforts should be done for that uh, uh, excellent efforts. efforts should be done at a, at, a, at a high speed so that we can uh, avoid such losses in future so our role was to rehabilitate mangrove ecosystem in the Indus Delta and Sin Forest Department worked since 1986 and onwards. And, uh, and luckily, we uh, have done a lot of uh, rehabilitation work. At least one third of the delta, I would say, at least 200,000 hectares mangroves are available, are, are there in different shapes and sizes in the Indus Delta at the moment. So this is one of the activity that has been done consistently with small or uh, smaller fundings from the uh, uh, ADB or from the Asian Development Bank or other uh, uh, organizations. So we have done this particular activity consistently and it has, it has given very good result and it has definitely uh, played its role in creating the uh, uh, ecosystem improvement uh, by giving aid to the uh, fishery and the shrimp and uh, fisheries breeding grounds and the, and the resilience from the surges of uh, erosion and intrusion to those uh, people who are living besides those developed mangroves. But the, uh, the, the overall uh, question again is that, is this mangrove activity is sufficient to create resilience among the local communities or not. From my perspective, from my, uh, you can say, 30 years experience in this ecosystem is that, that it is insufficient. It is not sufficient to create, to, to build 100% resilience in the coastal communities or to create a, a sort of a barrier for the people whereby they cannot be affected further from sea intrusion or sea erosion or the cyclone or tsunami phenomena. So this, they can, mangroves, there is a biological barrier that can only reduce the impact. But we have to do, we have to identify the areas where these are in direct uh, uh, hit of the sea intrusion or the, uh, or the uh, oceanic or uh, uh, sea water, whereby we have to create some sort of barrier as we saw, saw in the Bangladesh uh, presentation that they have done very well uh, with uh, uh, engineering structures or, or the, uh, the biological structures being done. So uh, from our perspective, we are doing uh, and we uh, uh, will be doing under certain projects. Uh, NDMA project is in pipeline whereby we are planning to have more 40,000 hectares of mangroves in the next four or five years. So this particular activity is being done and uh, uh, it has its own. They, we are trying to link now these uh, particular activities with the socioeconomic conditions of local people uh, to a greater extent so that they can have a, a, a condition of, uh, you can say, they, whereby they can have a resilience from these uh, issues. So I would again say that uh, uh, it's, it's a coordinating effort where all departments at, uh, working at the national level and the departments at the provincial level needs a coordinating uh, mechanism. And uh, it should be transparent enough that should we should uh, see the activities on ground and uh, we can have a suggestion for each other on that uh, to have proper impact of our activities on the, lo uh, the local communities and the livelihood of the local community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Riyaz uh, Thank you for uh, making us aware of the activities that are being done by the same forest department. The next speaker in the line is uh, Ms. Dr. Nuzat Khan, who is the ex-director general of the uh, National Institute of Oceanography 
and uh, she has a brilliant career. She served this institution for more than 33 years, and uh, she was instrumental in development planning of the Institute uh, uh, for uh, NIU Vision 2025. She has been awarded National NIU Excellence Award for 2011, and also she was awarded Living Planet Award by WWF Pakistan. She has been uh, visiting scientists for many of the international institutions. Some of them are known to be the leading institution in the world. She has also done networking with some of the top organization in the world. And she, um, she has published a lot of scientific work in various journals and in various uh, presented a uh, number of presentation in national and international level. May I request uh, Dr. Nusat Khan uh, to make a presentation uh, related to resilience in coastal communities in Pakistan. And Dr. Uh, thank you, Moses. Yeah, thank you, Moses, sir, for an elaborated introduction. Thank you very much, and thank you, Aisha, for inviting me uh, for this uh, uh, gathering, uh, um, uh, elaborating or maybe introduction of uh, impact of seawater intrusion in Indus Delta Creek system in this Delta. And basically, um, uh, what we would like to address it is the climate change and an environmental impact on uh, Indus Delta. As we all are aware of uh, speed of carbon emissions is 0.896 metric tons to 1.4 metric tons per capita for Southeast Asia for us. But for uh, the developed countries, this is much more higher. That make us the vulnerable, uh, more vulnerable than in the world. We are on top 10 most vulnerable uh, countries in the world as per international uh, references. As we all are aware that uh, the speed of climate change and the impact of climate change on Pakistan and Pakistan coastal area is much. Uh, we lost almost 1,477,000 debt. And uh, loss about six billion of economics during 1995 to 2001, just because of extreme weather condition or climate event. And we also suffered uh, losses of um, uh, agriculture, land, livelihoods, and uh, road networks and other infrastructure just because of the uh, flood and uh, earthquake and tsunami, not tsunamis, the earthquake as well. Uh, so, uh, uh, the uh, Indus Delta is more vulnerable, or Indus uh, Sin is more vulnerable. Uh, if you look at the figures uh, of 2011 flood, uh, the most of our agriculture uh, land are more, most effectively. Uh, these um, uh, last five years, 2010 to 14, uh, the result in mortality loss of uh, uh, the economical loss about you know, 18 billion with uh, 38.12 million people suspected and 3.4 million houses damaged and 10.63 million acres of crop destroyed. And this all make um, sin more vulnerable. If we look at this, sea, uh, sin means uh, we have um, a 1,000 coastal area, 1,005, approximately 1,000 is major part is um, Balustan coast. This is uh, approximately 70% and less than 30% is in coastal area. It's about 276 kilometers. But Sindh is more um, uh, economically significant. Like uh, we have uh, uh, Karachi, 72 uh, kilometer of coastline is the most developed. Uh, area of the coastal belt is about six, more than 65% of industrial activities is from, from Karachi. And we have a uh, mangrove ecosystem and this support our uh, fisheries. Uh, sorry, unfortunately, there's a uh, connectivity problem. I can't share my presentation. So I'm, I'm trying to um, do it um, uh, orally, right? And this uh, mangrove ecosystem, again, is the um, is a lifeline of uh, our coastal variable economical fisheries. And this is um, uh, the largest, uh, fifth largest uh, mangrove forest. If we talk about uh, the arid 
climate change, climate change. If you look at the, uh, some of the features like islands, and they are continuously under the erosion drift because of the human activities and impact of the climate change as well. If you look at the uh, Bandal Island, is shrinking down, is eroded, eroded a lot uh, from 1998 to 2008 or maybe 2000, uh, 2021. And if you look at our uh, tidal regime, if we um, uh, tidal area is minus 0 0.4 to increase is like plus 0.11. And uh, mean, uh, mean lowest uh, level water is the 0.97 to 1.57. And it's continuously increasing this partially the tidal phenomena and tidal amplitude as well. And there is one more phenomena. There are um, uh, in this delta is under stress just because of um, uh, two phenomena. One is the flush rains, that means melting of glaciers and increase in um, uh, flood rains. And then uh, number two is sea level rise. That means uh, with the increase in temperature, the sea is getting expanded and intrude in the low line in this Delta region. Uh, not only Pakistan in this Delta under pressure, but we look if we look at these uh, stats around the world, uh, especially the University of Colorado um, says that the most of world low line deltas are shrinking by the human activity, making them increasingly vulnerable to the flood from the river and the ocean storm and putting 10 of the million of people at risk. 10 million people at the risk. That means more than 10 million people are dependent on Indus Daltaic resources or Indus Daltaic livelihood. The study concluded that 24 out of the 33 major deltas are shrinking and the 85% experienced a severe flood in the recent year resulting in the temporarily submerged of roughly 100,000 square kilometer of land. About 5,000 people in the world live on the Indus Delta system or Indus Delta area. If you look at our Indus Delta, the cyclone causes major huge losses, vast low line area of Delta induced by, by seawater. But I can't share the picture, but again, there is a phenomenon of cyclone in, the, in Pakistan coastal area from 1897 as the Mr. Mazan sub elaborated until uh, 2010 in Makran coastal area and 2007 in Sin coastal area and much more. These are the frequency of cyclone happen to our coastal area. There are phenomena of seawater intrusion. The seawater intrusion is much worse during the Southwest monsoon, promoted the seawater intrusion up to 80 kilometer upstream. Seawater intrusion has resulted in tidal movement over 1.2 uh, million hectare of land in the in this, in this delta, rice crop, over banana, papaya, they all vanish up. And adverse impact on biodiversity, reduce area of mangrove forest, agricultural land, wetland, increase in the salinity in the freshwater lakes or maybe groundwater contamination. And if we look at the Indus Delta, is the, I can't share that picture. So, sorry, uh, it's so pretty. Uh, again, uh, the, uh, so this is the problem of uh, uh, Indus seawater intrusion and especially low line Indus Delta system. And I am um, uh, conducting a um, study on monitoring of uh, seawater intrusion, the sea level and sea level rise uh, and coastal erosion land subsidies along Sin and Bulusan coastal area. This, this is a PSDD project. And the objective of this project is to investigate seawater intrusion along the coastal area of Pakistan through a scientific observation to assess the rate of sea, sea level rise and land subsidence to find out the causes of erosion through the scientific observation and relevant data for the assessment, its impact on the coastal area. Uh, to develop the mitigation strategy for countering the seawater intrusion and the coastal erosion. Basically, these are the initiatives which, uh, which, which NIO is um, uh, initiated and most probably for identifying and addressing the seawater intrusion and land subsidence and erosion patterns need to have 
a scientific rational. If we find a scientific rational, rational we may uh, find the mitigation measures uh, for, uh, for production of Delta and the livelihood of coastal communities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mazum sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nusrat. And the last speaker in the line is Mr. Irfan Tariq, uh, who happened to be the Director General of Environment and Climate Change at the Ministry of Climate Change. Uh, Mr. Uh, Irfan Tariq uh, is, uh, has joined the ministry in 1991. And since then, he is uh, serving in this particular position uh, or in various positions, but now he's Director General. Mr. Tariq is also the national focal point for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and has been involved in the climate uh, negotiations since the Rio summit. He is also the serving on the vice chair for the working group two of the intergovernmental panel for climate change is IPCC. So may I request Mr. Irfan Tariq to make a presentation on the issue of uh, resilience in coastal areas in Pakistan. Mr. Rifan Tariq. Is Mr. Rifan Tariq there? I'm afraid I don't see his name there anymore. He had joined in the beginning, but then maybe something official came up and he had to exit because I don't see him anymore. I think uh, we will keep looking for him in the meantime, perhaps. You can open the floor for question and answers. And if he rejoins, then request him to make his presentation, if that's all right with you. Thank you, Aisha. Uh, now the floor is open for discussion, but uh, there are a few people who have raised their hand for question. I'll uh, request them that they may post their question in chat box so that we can uh, answer as many questions as possible. Else, otherwise, it would be very difficult to manage all of the uh, presenters. So those who have raised their hand, I request them to post their question in the chat box so that we get it. So starting with the question answer session, there is uh, a question asked by uh, Afia Siddiqui on uh, to uh, Ms. Sarwana, uh, as Ms. Sarwana Kazi, that is resilient embedded in the impact reduction or does the degradation in the coastal environment trigger population migration? Savarna? Uh, hello, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, very good question. Uh, for uh, sustainable systems, uh, resilience must be uh, embedded uh, into, uh, into impact reduction and, and degradation of the environment or the coastal environment will certainly have an impact on the livelihood of these uh, coastal populations. In Bangladesh, our coastal area is particularly uh, vulnerable and, and poverty is really rampant. Uh, but at the same time, our country is very small and we're very densely populated. So I do hear a lot of discussion on, on, on migration, uh, but really to, to where? So Dhaka, which is our capital, uh, from coast to Dhaka, if somebody were to come here, there's already 20,000 people per square kilometer uh, here. So it's, it's it, the, the, the options of degradation is, uh, and, and the alternative is, is really trying to move for, moving into a direction where where it must be really focusing on uh, absolutely ensuring to stop degradation in these coastal areas, but really going forward with more conservation and preservation, uh, awareness of uh, environmental systems. And many times it's people who are living in the coast, they are more aware than others on how powerful nature is and the importance of uh, 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 ensuring the con conservation of uh, not having that degradation. Um, and so I think, how can we have just a more uh, approach from, from all parts of uh, society to ensure that uh, uh, environmental uh, degradation is, is limited as, as much as possible? Because the option of, um, uh, the option of this uh, migration really is, is, is not very much uh, an option in, in Bangladesh. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, there are... Uh... 
a number of questions. Dr. Ghulam Rasool have I've asked any panelists on the impact of increasing frequency of cyclone, wind storm, and increasing intensity of monsoon in Karachi metropolitan? Anyone, any one of the panelists? Hello. Uh, maybe Riaz Hogan can address this. Uh, yeah, I just uh, saw one question that uh, South Asia is warming more than something like that. Uh, are you referring to that one? No, they are talking about the increasing frequency of cyclone in the storms and in, increasing the intensity of monsoon in Karachi metropolitan. Okay. Actually, uh, uh, this uh, is the directly related to the uh, med department, but the, uh, we have all, uh, you and we we all uh, observed that uh, this is a sort of cycle. You can see that the wet cycle and the dry cycles. Monsoon in the past does occur in Karachi more severely than the last one. And uh, it's it's a it's a cycle, but yes, there are uh, uh, some you can say uh, due to this uh, global warming and due to uh, more impact of uh, uh, you can say the warm globe, and particularly in the area where we have we don't have uh, much vegetation cushion for the uh, uh, sequestration of carbon. There is some sort of triggering effect on uh, that monsoon, but uh, overall, it's it's uh, uh, not beyond you can say the control. It's our mismanagement that has created a lot of mess. Otherwise, I don't think that that there is uh, much more impact vis-a-vis uh, -vis this uh, monsoon uh, rainfall. I have seen after this uh, monsoon uh, uh, data of uh, med department. Uh, of last hundred years, it's it's not very unusual to me. Thank you. Uh, uh, Muslim sir, yeah. Muslim sir, may I add something? May sure. I? Sure. Sure. Uh, if you're talking about the frequency of cyclone, windstorm, and increase in density of monsoon on Karachi metropolitan, yes, it is. Uh, if you look at, uh, yeah, this is a normal natural phenomena of uh, monsoon and is um, uh, changing the precipitation spectrum and the wind also. Uh, but uh, due to the uh, un uh, unplanned development of coastal area, and the Karachi is a, basically a metropolitan hub and a lifeline of all entire Pakistan. But uh, these all industrial installation at the coast. If you look at these, uh, uh, the installation and the erosion patterns and the cyclones, these all installations are at vulnerable. And the increasing uh, erosion and siltations make them more vulnerable and their maintenance cost is pretty high. Similarly in harbor and port areas. And if God forbid, Pakistan lies on uh, Karachi, especially on a triple junction. If something happen in future, if Karachi is chalked up with um, any um, extreme disaster, uh, so what will be happen? We are not prepared for. We need to prepare for extreme climatic conditions which we are facing. Either as Mr. Riaz said, this is a um, mess management. So we need to manage as per uh, the intensity or frequency of disasters. Uh, any kind of natural disaster, we need to be prepared and our coastal industries and coastal areas should be prepared accordingly. Thank you, Mazum sir. Uh, Dr. Nuzat, there is a question specifically addressed to you uh, and asked by uh, Afia. What about the potential of tectonic changes in the delta and fear of subsidence which can aggravate the existing effect of sea intrusion? Uh, okay, this has already been happened. If you look at our coastal area, unfortunately, I can't share that picture, which is uh, showing the change in uh, coastal area and the waters, uh, sea waters intrude much high in, uh, in this Delta region. And uh, this is very uh, fastly happened. And, and I was going to be conduct the rate of uh, intrusion and subsidence of the Delta. 
But again, as I mentioned earlier, the Karachi is located on a triple junction. There is a probability and possibility of bigger natural disasters. And Dr. Asif Anand is there. He's expert on these um, earthquake and tsunamis and, uh, and his uh, uh, tectonics. I'm not a tectonic person. I request Dr. Asif Anand to elaborate the tectonic activities in especially in Sundan Karachi coastal area. Thank you, Majin, sir. Dr. Asif Hinam. I think there is a problem. Uh, may, there is a question to Mr. Wagan Saab. The threat to mangroves include the release of heavy metal, toxic substance, and industrial waste. What measures have been taken by the government? Wagan Saab? Yeah, yeah. Wagan uh, Saab? Yeah, definitely uh, the, that threat is there on the Karachi coast, especially where these industrial uh, units are located. And uh, the uh, only thing that has been observed through some studies and through uh, visual observation is that, that these toxic materials and the uh, uh, pollutants are very dangerous for the regeneration, particularly the regeneration in that particular area. But the mangroves, which are already there, and the uh, you can say the mature and submature mangroves, there is uh, some sort of eutrophication effect on them. You can say the mineral enrichment is there in the water and soil, and that's why the uh, uh, minerals are in, uh, taken up by the uh, submature and mature, and they have no so far. They have for the last 20, 25 years. We are seeing that none of the patch of the mangroves have been dried or destroyed due to these impacts. However, the regeneration is not coming up due to this eutrophication, which is also a big loss in that particular area. So uh, we are trying this to uh, address through EPA because EPA has the mandate to stop the, uh, uh, you can say the release of uh, pollutants in the sea and in the coastal waters. So they are, uh, uh, even yesterday, we had a talk in a meeting that uh, at least some sort of a, a law should be there so that they cannot release the uh, pollutants and toxic materials in the uh, coastal area of Karachi. Thank you. Parayasa, there is another question that was addressed to you. Uh, do the management plan include uh, something to revive deltaic, riverine agriculture or total shift in the livelihood due to sea intrusion? Uh, basically, uh, riverine uh, ecosystem and uh, this coastal ecosystem are two different ecosystems. Uh, riverine forest or the riverine area, it is about 2 million acres starting from uh, Kotki, uh, 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 this uh, Gudu Barrage up to the uh, uh, Karochan area. And all these, uh, uh, this uh, ecosystem has been affected due to shortage of water in the river due to uh, a diversion of water upstream, gradually since early, uh, since 30s, it has gradually been decreased to the level that these riverine forests, especially downstream Kotri Barrage, they don't receive flood water. They seldom receive, receive flood water that when there is a high flooding, uh, just like in 2010 and 15. And so uh, uh, the, uh, Sin Forest Department in that particular area, the, the, this all land doesn't belong. This is a, a one thing that is to be a look at that uh, out of 2 million acres, Sin Forest Department has only 6 lakh acres. It's about one third of, less than one third of the area. So uh, the other people who are uh, having their ownership in uh, Riverine Tract, they are doing it from different ways. They are uh, uh, taking uh, uh, water through tube wells, they are diverting irrigation system water into the riverine track and they are doing their uh, agriculture, although part of that is illegal, but they are doing because this is uh, something which needs to be looked at from the perspective that people do need the uh, uh, food and uh, supplies uh, uh, for the betterment of the community and society as a well. whole. So these people are doing that but that uh, water has reduced drastically. So 
now uh, this is a policy issue that whether throughout the year we should release some water in the river so that this riverine ecosystem should be alive at the moment it's alive in bits and pieces it's not totally alive since forest department now what we are doing we are uh, uh, we have abandoned our agroforestry policy on the direction of supreme court and we are reviving to forestry again full forestry uh, through our uh, whatever meager resources we have uh, in last two years we have uh, uh, revived about 100000 acres from 600000 acre 100000 acres have been regenerated either through river water or through lift irrigation system or through tree wells thank you uh, there is a very interesting question that uh, i think we may address to uh, commander uh, Commander Saab, uh, that is uh, about the flood in uh, Dayan Azmabad. Uh, the question is, uh, are there enough boats in Karachi? Floods, if, uh, if flood, Karachi flood in Dayan Azmabad was under one floor of water, are there enough uh, camps near hills of North Azmabad? So, Commander Saab, would you like to address this particular question? Yeah, could you please repeat the question? I just missed the first part of it. Yeah, the question, the first part is the are there enough boats if Karachi floods like the what happened in North Azmabad, which was under the uh, flood for one floor of water was uh, present in that Nyan Azmabad. So is there enough camps near hills of North Azmabad? Yeah, of course, we do have uh, uh, boats as well as standby arrangement for evacuation of the population wherever uh, flood hits, even in Karachi, though it is uh, 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 not as uh, uh, normal or more frequent than the other parts of the sin, like in the Riverine Belt. But still, we keep enough stock of uh, boats readily available here in Karachi. Apart from that, we have given few boats to the Army and the Navy as well for in case of the uh, need in case of uh, any uh, such eventuality. Uh, as far as the uh, camps are concerned, yes, we do identify various places such as schools like uh, one of our presenter presented that the Bangladesh is using a model where uh, they are using the school multi-purpose buildings which are used for use uh, for schools as well as for the shelters. Uh, but we, uh, we have identified points at various locations in Karachi. Uh, which can be used for uh, for uh, relief camps during any emergency. Uh, though we uh, the use of schools is not that much encouraged by us because we had a very uh, bad experience in uh, floods of 2010 when um, most of the pop uh, or the uh, evacuees were uh, kept in the schools and uh, by the end of uh, the time when they left, uh, the condition of the schools deteriorated to the level that we had to put up uh, put enough investment to bring them back. Uh, but we do have uh, uh, places at Karachi where which can be used for this purpose. I, there is another question which I think is uh, any member of the panel can answer, but Afia can be the right person to answer that. Uh, the question is that recently we saw huge controversy about the development of island of Karachi. The question is how would the development benefit the communities and how will it impact the overall in terms of environment. If Afia is there, I'll request her to answer this particular question. Thank you, Mohsen Saab, although you are the best person to answer this question. Uh, basically, uh, there are no communities that live on Bandal Island. They actually uh, benefit from it in a different way. There is also a cultural uh, aspect of uh, not disturbing it. Then there are the mangroves as well as it is, uh, so there is still a controversy whether it is a turtle foraging ground or turtle nesting ground. So that needs to be uh, thrashed out. In any case, you know what Dr. Nuzat had just mentioned, if you focus only on that one point, that is uh, the, uh, the island is, she used the word diminishing. How can you plan a city on a space which is diminishing? Also, it is right at the, uh, you know, at the uh, shipping lane of Fort Carson Authority and your very sensitive um, uh, cargo goes over there or your LNG goes over there and you are planning to build a whole city over there. Uh, where are the resources going to come from? What is the cost of getting the resources to the people of that uh, island? So there are 
there are human, there are legal, there are uh, environmental factors. They all have to be seen in totality. And the very first uh, thing that uh, needs, and it has been basically settled by the court, that the people who were making plans for this island had absolutely no legal right. They are not the owners of that uh, piece of land. And uh, so it was a jurisdictional issue. So that has been settled. But because this keeps cropping up after every few years, so we hope that now, uh, after looking at the ecological and environmental aspects for which uh, IUCN had also formed a subcommittee to submit a report which would take in uh, almost, almost on the lines of an EIA, which by the way, uh, we had, nobody knows whether an EIA was even made before these plans for building a city were floated and an authority was made, which of course is now redundant. So, so these uh, parachuted plans actually need to be discouraged. They need to be pushed back because there are many, many elements that need to be looked at when any kind of development is planned. And in this uh, particular aspect, they were. Yes, there are mangroves. Mangroves are protected forests. Uh, so you can't just you know, go into a place and suddenly say, uh, we are going to uh, save this little piece of uh, the forest, which we know doesn't happen. They are going to have different impacts. About We are not good at managing our entire city's sewage. What about the uh, waste effluents, et cetera, that will be emanating from this uh, planned development? And how is that going to uh, harm the ecology? So I think an expert like you can comment on it, but we have to check all the boxes. We have to check the boxes of law, of jurisdiction, of uh, community rights, of ecology, and of trade. So we need to actually look at all those things in totality and then take this discussion forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the question answer session is almost uh, over. I'll end it. This, uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, if I can just add one thing into it, uh, which uh, Madam sure. Afia has added. Sure. Uh, sir, this is uh, uh, attorney Muslim bin Akil, uh, admiralty and maritime lawyer, uh, BFM from National Defense University. Uh, I had my thesis on the development of island and making it uh, a milestone for the development and integrity at the national level. Number one, uh, when we are talking about, yes, I cannot agree more what uh, just uh, Madam Afia said, and she is absolutely right that when there is no basic grassroots level plan, then we are doing something, a bigger project like island development that can put everything into uh, like a disaster from monetary economics to all the resources that have ever been utilized to establish that. Fair enough, very good. But when we say developing the island, since uh, Prime Minister of Pakistan, Honorable Imran Khan Niazi Saab, has said a frequent times at different forums and different platforms that includes the National Assembly, floor of the house, then different offices, some recorded, some unrecorded, that he wants to build in order to cater the upcoming global issue that is the overpopulation but yes, we have to first make the assessment where he wants to put his dream into the tangible and feasible conditions. Very first thing when we are talking about the development of the island, it is about that what and how and in what domains and uh, under what lens we see the development. What kind of development is feasible there? What kind of development is not feasible there? Uh, in, our, uh, in our recent uh, conversation uh, with the Justice, uh, Justice Abba of the Supreme Court, uh, I don't want to mention the name, uh, he was also of the same view as of uh, Madam Mafia, but there are things that can be done and these kinds of projects that are like the island development or the coastal tourism development or the initiatives or the business of, businesses of the blue economy since Madam Dr. Nuzat is here, um, she had conducted a very good program for uh, the things of a uh, blue economy and the blue economy covering the different aspects of Pakistan. So when we are talking about, yes, uh, there are mangroves, mangroves, they are uh, uh, like storing the carbon, uh, the red carbon issue there that uh, is a natural habitat of uh, the uh, turtles and the shrimps and uh, that is a muddy island, but we need to see that what kind of development can be done there. According to the Ramsar Convention, there is a hard debate that those areas are meant to be MPAs, marine protected areas. But if they are a marine protected area, we cannot construct anything or we cannot do anything. But to be honest, uh, in a recent conversation with the officials from the Pakistan Navy, 
I came to know that since there, that's a muddy island, uh, there is a restriction of development, but yet there are some projects that are ongoing on that island that includes the installations of different radars. So there are things we can do. And if we, you go through the Bonn Convention or the Ramsar Convention, you can see that all these conventions which different states have ratified, that includes Pakistan, or those conventions which haven't been ratified by Pakistan, uh, these all denotes towards the fact that uh, uh, yes, things should be developed, but the exploitation should be meaningful and must be done uh, in a sustainable manner. For that purpose, we have uh, SDGs that is sustainable developmental goals. But we cannot say the fact with all due respect to all the members sitting here in this forum or all those who are working on it, you all have very much experience and uh, must have a high given uh, very much rich resources towards these projects. But in my humble submission, I think that development first be defined and afterwards these two islands, if they are sought after their seismic interpretation, like uh, 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 the, what kind of land is there, how much pressure it can bear, such things could be, have been done. Like if it is about the mangroves and the people from the Karachi, the Karachites or the Pakistanis, and they are concerned about the climate change that is going to, uh, uh, happen um, uh, the conference I'm talking about the conference and all the aspects of the climate change if they are really that uh, uh, concerned about it what I really believe is if it is about the development there should be sanctuaries there should be a scientific development there should be a scientific establishment of the laboratories if not the uh, if not uh, like making up the skyscrapers for the living of the people there are multiple islands uh, uh, that can be developed for the people living and uh, the coastal tourism in the same way from uh, like uh, uh, ferries, electrical ferries uh, connecting uh, Iran, uh, Gwadar, Karachi, uh, in the can can generate a lot of a lot of money that can directly get into the tax net. And one more thing, one more thing, with all due respect uh, from all the reports we have from our uh, different institutes who uh, work as an intelligentsia, there is a, a very strong narrative that has been built over the islands for the reason that. Since uh, absence of any regulatory authority, or uh, you can say the reluctance of the re regulatory authority contemporarily working over there uh, in uh, terms of this field, are reluctant to invite any further authority that can maintain a check and balance for the reason that a very small sector of the fisheries for per annum like fleshes out without making it, bringing it into the tax net around four to $5 million. So this is, uh, this is something we are talking about, the 1% of the total thing, and 1% constitutes nothing. But all those money that has been generated from uh, getting into the tax net is directly uh, sporting uh, a very a powerful political elite structure of Karachi. And if uh, there is an authority that has, uh, that would, uh, or that uh, uh, could have been established, that thing could have hampered uh, those things getting into uh, the monetary benefits and uh, I, I, think your point, I think your point has been very well taken. I think let's move on um, with the discussion and give uh, the panelists the floor to make their closing statements, please. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can I quickly uh, respond to that to just one point? That Madam, all, the, all the things that you are saying that you want this, 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 fine, they can be done. Why don't you go and make a constitutional amendment and allow that authority to there? You know, you can't just go by a wish list. There are laws. Ma Madam, we have we have uh, worked over the constitution. Yeah, I, 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 I think we need to get on, please, with yeah. the with the webinar. And if you don't mind, please ex excuse me please, for Madam, jumping in, Moazam. Uh, uh, <laughs> but but yeah. you know, we have a timeline here to maintain. We Thank still you very have much, uh, Attorney Muslim Saab. Uh, the, this topic is not related to this particular uh, webinar and there it has to be discussed and there is a lot to be, there are serious issues related to development of Ireland. Uh, before uh, giving the, the, panel, the, the panelists to make their uh, final comments, uh, there is a question which was addressed to me uh, and it says that any data of the marine fishes business potential of the creeks and quality of stock can view of the pollution. Yes, there are. Uh, there have been studies that have been carried out. So there is a study available under the fishery resource assessment uh, done by the FAO and Marine Fisheries Department. There is a, one particular report that deals with the potential 
uh, fisheries in the three area. There was one study carried out by the InfoFish and uh, conducted by the Sin Fisheries Department in the same area. So there is a lot of information available. So uh, I think with this, we conclude the Coastal Arts session and we'll move to uh, for final uh, comment from each of the part. Uh, the participant or uh, presenter. So may I request Tavarna uh, Kazi to make her final comments and let it be very short. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, to the organizer organizers for the invitation and to the World Bank uh, Pakistan office. Uh, in closing, let me just say it's uh, an integrated approach to coastal resilience. So we do need the physical uh, structural investments. We do need coastal uh, protection. People are very vulnerable. Uh, but at the same time, we must also address the drivers of risk, uh, build capacity and partnerships, strengthen the communities, uh, have proper coastal planning and enforce the regulations, and then also embed into the educational systems uh, awareness, uh, carry out research on design standards, on saline tolerant uh, cropping systems, uh, mangrove plantations, and of course, uh, as we all discussed, uh, include more nature-based uh, initiatives to find solutions. But essentially, it's just to have a much more holistic and integrated approach uh, to resilience, which is the key. Uh, again, thank you very much to all of you. I think this was such a great opportunity for us to exchange uh, between our two countries that are also facing these uh, similar coastal hazards. Uh, thank you again. Uh, that's all for me. Thank you very much, uh, Savarna. And uh, now, Commander Sayyid Salman Shah uh, for his final comments. I also thank you all for giving me this opportunity to be part of this uh, such a lovely gathering in which we have discussed uh, on the topic of this coastal resilience. Um, my concluding remarks would be just to, uh, we need to improve the livelihood conditions of the coastal uh, community uh, because uh, with, the, with the points which we just listened to during the presentations by various uh, presenters, that the conditions in the coastal belt has de uh, deteriorated with the passage of time, especially with the uh, uh, with the uh, with the you know. We have lost you, sir. Have you completed? The approach is the key uh, for better resilience. Thank you very much. Uh, may I request now uh, Mr. Riaz Ahmed Wagan for his final comments? Uh, thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity to talk about the forest, Vedro Forest, and the work of Forest Department. And I would, uh, in the end, I would say that it's all proper identification of the issue, then proper research on that, and with the coordinating effort, we have planned to do the best for the communities in the coming years. So we need coordinating effort in this one department cannot do anything. Although everybody has their own mandate, they are doing this, but we need to have a, uh, you can say, coordination centric to the communities so that communities can get better benefit of that. Thank you. Dr. Dusat Khan for last uh, some last views uh, on this subject. Thank you, once again. Thank you, um, the host, and especially um, Ms. Aisha for organizing uh, such an interesting uh, seminar. Uh, my two recommendations for uh, this panel, uh, may, we may take up uh, as an integrated partner on. And number one, if you are talking about the island development, um, oh, yes, yes it's, uh, our coastal to... area need to be developed. It need to be developed. No argument on that. Our I coastal, coastal area is it. about thousand kilometer, and so only Karachi, that is uh, less than one percent of the coastline, is developed. As far as industrial development and recreational, is also. So is uh, is no argument on development, but the problem is we need to find the scientific data and rational for the development, the ecology of that area and the erosion pattern of that area, that going to be a huge investment. We need to um, study for the erosion patterns, which NIO has already done in early 90s. 
so it's need to be revised because this is over 20 years or maybe 30 years need to be revised the erosion patterns and uh, the ecology of that area and the scientific rationale of that area so on this scientific ground this area could be developed number one uh, again, uh, the NIO is developed at Coastal Zone Management in 1996. And it is again 25 years old uh, document if you want to uh, create more uh, uh, scientific rationale of our coastal development strategy and resilience and capacity building. That document needs to be revisited and uh, 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 revisit again and is need to be revived and reconstituted. These two recommendations from my side is need to be done Maybe these are two recommendations from my side. Thank you once again. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, all the panelists. Uh, uh, so uh, before concluding, I just would like to say that uh, we have discussed in detail the issue of resilience of the coastal communities, but uh, coastal areas, and but the, we have not touched upon greatly on the role of communities in the area. Just to elaborate on what I want to say is that uh, the coastal communities on their own have been uh, very much uh, aware of the of their vulnerability. One particular very good example is that of a community that is living in Manihor area. Uh, and they have developed their own early warning system, although they have taken on board the provincial disaster management uh, authority as well as uh, the local uh, administration. But this system is based on the volunteers. There are about 30 volunteers who are on this particular uh, early warning system. And within no time, the, because now the mobile phones and Android phones are available to almost all adults and maybe to some children also. So within no time, they inform about any of the climate related issues. So we have tested this particular system when there was a um, there was an event of this uh, um, uh, an earthquake in Balochistan, and within two minutes the whole community was made aware of that there is a earthquake that has taken place on the coastline, and there may be a possibility of uh, a tsunami. So within no time they were able to get this information. Otherwise, if the communities are not made aware of such things. The disaster of 1999 is very much there. The cyclone, which uh, uh, Bagan Saab has mentioned, two year cyclone in 1999, the damage it caused is still, uh, we were unable to, uh, uh, to, uh, to make them because some even the damage that has been done to the left out full bank drain is uh, very much there. Some of the very good freshwater or estuarine lake have converted into saline lagoons. So there has to be a good uh, awareness of a uh, warning system. But things are improved. In 2010, when we have a uh, pet cyclone, the coastal community was made aware of uh, the coming cyclone and they have moved to better places. So there was practically very little damage or very little effect to the human being. So we have to be aware of the uh, situation. We have to develop uh, the system uh, resistance. Some of the things which uh, uh, Savarna has pointed out and done in Bangladesh, we have to replicate them because they have been facing a lot of floods and cyclones. So we being also a, a maritime nation may face such a situation. So the, we may have, we also talk about uh, coastal protection and also about uh, the uh, some of the measures that is required to be taken after such a disaster. With this, I think uh, we conclude this particular uh, webinar, and I think it was very well attended. And uh, I think we have the, the main purpose of this seminar was achieved. So in the end, I thank uh, the uh, uh, Swiss Society Coalition for Climate Change and especially Ms. Aisha for providing with this opportunity to be the moderator and providing the opportunity for the member of panel panelists to be uh, talking about this very important topic. Thank you very much. I just to like you, to um, add, thank you, thank you. I just like to add on that on behalf of the World Bank and CSCCC, you know, we, uh, we are delighted. This was a brilliant session and the two parameters that 
I use to gauge the measure of success of any webinar discussion is A, the number of participants and two, the quality of the question and answer session because we expect all our panelists to make brilliant presentations because they're experts in their field. But in the two categories that I mentioned, we had a robust participation and I think the Q&A session was also very, very interactive. Uh, for me, this was very informative. It was very educational and I hope that the participants, uh, the audience participants part of it also found it very useful. I think the presentations made by Swar Nakazi, Salman Shah, Riaz Vagan, and Dr. Nuzat have helped us in developing uh, an understanding of the full spectrum of uh, what sea level rise means to coastal areas and what all it takes to make uh, the coastal areas more resilient, both the land and the people and the infrastructure and industry that is linked to it. So we are now also after this discussion equipped with a very good set of recommendations that we hope will be useful in steering policy direction on way forward. So thank you once again um, for moderating the session, uh, Moazam. You maintain the timelines, which is always a difficult task, uh, and uh, the panelists for joining us. I'm sorry we missed out on Mr. Irfan Tarek, but um, there were other duties which took priority and he had uh, to leave and could not be part of this session. We hope to catch up with him uh, in the future sometime. So thank you. <laughs>